Hey everybody, welcome to the Future Podcast. I'm your host, Sean, and I'm here today with a very special guest, an old friend, uh, Ashley McDonald. How are you? Hi, Sean. I'm great. How are you doing? Yeah, keeping really well. So uh, just before we started the podcast, we were saying it's been about eight years since we actually probably had a conversation both of, when both of us left uh, secondary school or high school. Yes, it's been a while. I feel old now that we're able to say it's been eight years. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I feel a lot older these days. I'm sure some people are <laughs> listening to this and not uh, being angry, being angry at us for calling ourselves old. So, but, yes. uh, all, all other, I guess. So how are you? Good, keeping busy. Um, as you know, I'm now working in tech, so I work for Google, but I work on the luxury side of stuff. So the industry itself usually is not the most digital forward but at the moment as months have gone by with store closures etc uh, digital has been the way for them to move forward to stay open to stay relevant and to prepare for the future so it's actually been really really busy okay and how do you like uh how do you like that job give us a yeah i love it what is your no, it's great looking? yeah i think people are often like how can you work within tech and also within luxury it's basically what i've been doing now for the last six years so I started actually working for a pure player, so 100% online retailer called Monnier Frere. So I joined them first as an intern in Paris uh, when I moved over there as a student and I was their UK marketing manager. And then I helped them uh, on other markets as well, US markets, uh, Northern Americas, also Asia. And then from there, I joined LVMH Group as a digital analyst. So working directly with that group, they'd own like Louis Vuitton, Dior, Celine, all these fashion brands so working on their digital strategies i was there for a few year for for a few years and then about a year ago i moved back to ireland to join google and to join the luxury team so i'm global luxury account manager and basically my day to day is working with um, i have about 50 different brands luxury brands in my portfolio so i help them use technology um, for their business strategies, also for their marketing strategies. Obviously, there's a focus on Google products, so search, display, YouTube, but also using data as insights for their general business decision. So that's it in a nutshell. It's incredible. And um, what was it like? What was it like moving back to Ireland after being away for so long? Yeah, so I was away for about seven years, yeah. and I would come home one or two times a year. Yeah. but very different to move back. And I had never lived or worked as an adult in Ireland. So I had to adapt a lot, actually. And even now on a day-to-day -day basis, technically I work in a French team. So I still feel a little bit like I'm in France, especially now when working from home and during the day, most of the meetings I have are actually in French. So it's been, it's been a, a big change. <laughs> yeah. So obviously like you were very young when you when you left home you moved to a different country um but obviously you were incredibly proficient in uh, in french you did you obviously i know i know that you did french for your leaving certain you got on very well so which is like your high school exams for people who are listening here in north america um so how, how was that like how was that transition obviously speaking from speaking from, from talking to people that you know moved to canada or from another country when they learned english outside of that country there's there's nuances and differences how how was that for you yeah it's a good question actually i don't know if you remember but when we were in leaving cert year so last year of high school i actually won the academic award for french and it was probably the biggest shock of my life i couldn't believe that i won an academic award um but i actually tried really really hard i remember for that last year of high school i was in extra french classes every saturday because i knew i wanted to work in fashion and i had this dream of moving to paris so i worked really really hard on that and i remember um, an early adopter of Netflix, I switched it into French and I used to watch Gossip Girl in French. So that was the way that I became proficient in everything fashion related. It actually really helped. <laughs> Great because, idea. Like, yeah, like the academic French or the academics you would learn of any language, especially when you have a focus on you know, grammar and linguistics, it's not the, the language that you use in every day. So it was really important for me to be a good conversationalist, to be able to actually do interviews, to get my, um, my foot on the door for companies. So... I think I had two summers um, when I was 18 and 19 doing internships in France at the beginning. You know, I focused on jobs that needed people that were native English speakers, but because I was able to be immersed in the language, I was able to improve my skills. And then I actually did my bachelor degree. Uh, it was a double bachelor degree. So 
one part of it I did in France completely through French. So I was studying business, but studied it through French. So I took all my like classes and exams in French. The first semester was a disaster, but then after that it was okay. And then I think once you're immersed, you're fine. You're, you're like people can still tell I'm not French when I speak, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how did it transpire that you you know ended up uh, working with Google? Obviously, it's you know it's it's a, it's a probably probably one of the biggest com obviously one of the biggest companies in the world probably in the top in the top five was it very difficult to get the job anybody that i've anybody that i've spoke to who who is you know interviewed for google or you know looked at doing anything google related it's it's pretty intense can you tell us a little bit about that yeah it was pretty intense to be honest i think there were there were two companies i always wanted to work for lvmh group which is who i worked for in france and google and i probably have been applying for jobs at google for the last six seven years easily you know since the beginning i always applied for internships and everything i never even got like interviews so i knew that i needed to build up my skills to get in there and i think the advice i'd give is if you know what you're really interested in try and build up on those skills as much as possible and apply through that route so for me i knew like digital within the luxury industry i'd been doing that for six years that was the approach then by the end when i got in that helped me make that move um, the interview process itself, I actually really loved it. It was really interesting. I remember my first call that I had, the recruiter asked me, I thought he was just going to ask me about myself, but he actually asked me if we were to launch um, a product in India, so a tech product uh, in India, what would you do to grow adoption by 10% in the first year? I've actually never even been to India. So even trying to think about launching a product there was really difficult so i came up with an idea on the spot i said to him he's like okay tell me another idea he did that seven more times so i'd give him eight ideas on how to launch this product in india and grow up by 10 percent in the first year and then he said okay give me a recap and that's when i realized okay these guys are pretty serious so that was the inter that was interview number one of five <laughs> <laughs> but um but it was fun i liked it and i knew through the interview process i was like I actually would really like to work with this company i love the way they think and the way they problem solve and you always challenge yourself and the people around you but you lift up those around you as well so it's a very rare combination i think so a bit of a random question are you all google now have you a google like laptop google phone because i think you got the uh airpod iphone airpods in so <laughs> yeah we, well it's good to google see what competition there. is doing as well <laughs> i'm very much like even before joining Google, I had Google Assistant, so Google Home, which I really love. I have like three of them in my house. So everywhere you go, I even use it to turn on the lights and everything. Um, I probably went a little bit too extreme with that one. I think people get a bit scared when they come into my house. Everything is voice activated. Um, but yeah, no, I'm pretty pretty much uh, a big fan of all their products. Immersed. Yeah, I am as well. I prefer that. I prefer it much. I don't have an iPhone or anything. I'm all about Android for sure. Much, yeah. So right now what is your obviously your day-to-day -day is different when did you when did you move back home so it's more or less exactly a year ago and usually for the position that i have as i said i work on you know luxury clients who are headquartered in france yes. so as part of that role usually i'm meant to spend quite a bit of time in france in paris mm -hmm. meeting with my clients and unfortunately that's not the case anymore which has been a bit tough because i lived there for so long a lot of my friends are there uh, from college and from work so that's probably been the biggest change just not going anymore to france yeah and are you hoping that <clears throat> will it be the possibility that you'll go back when i suppose restrictions and stuff are lifted is your travel schedule should change you should be able to be there more often i'm not sure how things are going to change to be honest because it's really hard to plan ahead it's really hard to know when internationally we'll be able to travel and then on top of that it's how our companies are going to adapt to that as well so at google we definitely take a super safe approach you know even if we take into account our office in dublin it's the emea headquarters there are eight thousand people so it's really tough to imagine how we can return uh to normal as it was before so i think it's gonna only time will tell yeah that's the problem you know only time will tell something happened in the 70s i think there was uh was a flu called and it was called a the Hong Kong flu, that's what it was called, you know, that was the name of the flu itself. And it killed like 100,000 people in, in North America, not, not including the people that it killed in, in Asia. Now it was same as COVID, it's, you know, infirm, there are sick people. But because the world wasn't so connected, nobody even knows about that now, you know? But now because yeah, I didn't even know about that. Whenever something happens now, 
we all know and there's obviously a protection mechanism and everybody retreats and everybody gets afraid and we're making sure that everybody is taken care of so what happens if in five years there's something else you know or something else do we keep going into lockdown like is this just the world we live in now so it's it's a scary thought exactly i think technology has been like the saving grace for a lot of this you know even especially if we look at education for example when i'm looking at how how are children going to learn today luckily we do have for a lot of these kids ways that they can still learn and even for people that are doing their like bachelor degrees their master's degrees online mbas everything at least all this kind of stuff can be digitalized i see a lot of schools are adapting i think the ones that won't adapt unfortunately their students they will suffer from that mm -hmm. Definitely. But as you said, like maybe this, this could happen again in a few months. I saw in the last two days, Beijing has gone back down into lockdown again because of a second wave. So I think companies and societies have to be prepared for this to keep happening yeah. and to kind of future proof themselves. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, nobody is talking about like, uh, you know, diet and exercise. People are saying just, you know, wash your hands, uh, you know, Put on a face mask, you know, stay away from people. But the people who are surviving it or it's bouncing off them are people who are, you know, fit, healthy, eat well, rest well. I think we're one thing that should be taken from this, and one thing that we can control or we should be able to control is, you know, the rest we get, the exercise we get. We're a sedentary lifestyle because of the technology that we're that we're talking about. So I hope that people, you know, if you can tend to the garden that you can sow, like I can't. I can't stop, you know, a new disease from spreading across the world, but I can, you know, be as healthy as I can be, or I can be as careful as I can be. So that's the thing. Yeah, hopefully we, we get over it sooner rather than later. But um, something else I was going to ask you about uh, your, your time in France. Where did you, where did you spend there? Well, what, what cities were you in? So for two years, I was studying in a city called Reims, it's a very French name. But if you read it in an English way, it kind of looks like Reims. It's actually the capital of the Champagne region. So all of the Champagne in the world is produced there. So that was a great time. I can't Ooh. recommend it more. It's a great place to go study because the Champagne is cheap and plentiful. Um, in my first week, we even had like visit to Champagne houses that are partnerships with our, with our school. So that was fantastic. And then during that time I was doing internships in Paris. So I would kind of be back and forth. It's just an hour, about an hour train ride from Paris. And then I did my master's in Paris uh, at HEC. It's a little bit outside of the city. And then I worked like in Paris, right in the heart of the city then for a few years. So kind of basically in Paris the whole time or around. Yeah. That's nice. And uh, Amazing city to work in. Like it's just the most beautiful city. It's like an, an outdoor museum. I absolutely love it. I've been there twice. I was there once when, uh, once when I was very young, I went to Disneyland. So I was like 10 or 11. So that was obviously, uh, I have just kind of memories of the, the park itself. That's, that's about it. And then I went there just before we moved to Canada, um, myself and uh, my girlfriend, Difa, and then uh, Liam and Emer. So um, our friend. Oh, yes. <laughs> we went, yeah, we went for three days. So it was, uh, it was a blast. I loved it. It was one of the, probably the best place I've, I've ever been on, uh, on on vacation it was it was fantastic so we loved it so what do you what do you miss most about being there um i mean like you said it's just it's such a beautiful city so the architecture is so unique i don't think you see anything at least to that scale anywhere else there are other small french cities where you kind of have the essence of it but paris is just um it's immense in its beauty so i absolutely love that like i could walk around paris all day every day i used to walk to work 30 minutes back like each way every day I would never take the metro if I could avoid it just because I loved walking around the city it's amazing and then I'm really into art I've always been really into art and fashion so you have just every day there's um there's museums open when you're under 26 or maybe if it's even under 27 and you have a European passport you have free access to nearly all the museums which is amazing so there's a huge focus on culture in France especially around the creative arts and then I mean like for me, it's the fashion city. So every day at first when I was working at Monnier Frere, so they would work with like 200 different brands that they would sell on their website. And sometimes I'd get to go to the showrooms, whether it be for like Chloe or Burberry or any of these you know, massive brands. So that was really exciting. And then when I worked at the headquarters of LVMH, so they own all of the biggest brands. They're the biggest luxury group in the world. 
so that was just the most incredible thing ever for me and my office was on uh, Avenue Montagne uh, which is like the most uh, beautiful street in my opinion in Paris and it's full of all the, the amazing uh, like luxury fashion stores and every day I would walk past these and, you know, you never knew who you would meet in the office because and every person who is within the industry, like dreams of walking into that office one day. So that was absolutely huge. And then I was working just down the street from there at the, the Dior headquarters for a few years, which is one of their brands. Yeah. And again, like even just the, the travel that I got to have, which was outside of Paris, although I was based there, um, was was very very interesting I was very fortunate to get to do that especially now when I look back at the amount that I traveled I don't see things returning to that pace again for a long time in general I was every probably every five or six weeks I was in Asia so I was going quite often to South Korea China Singapore um, for work because they'd be really big markets for the luxury industry wow incredible travel a lot of travel. I built up a lot of miles, which now I can't use. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. We'll get back to normal. We, we will. I'm telling you. <laughs> so it's interesting that you were talking about the architecture. Um, so I'm a big history buff. So in World War II, uh, I think Paris is one of the only major cities that was left unleveled. You know, so all the architecture that you're talking about, you don't see it anywhere else. They were one of the only cities that wasn't, you know, just blitzkrieg by, by Germany. So. Yeah, that's something that I noticed there. The architecture is just, you know, um, breathtaking. Um, and then, then with your Google clients, what kind of clients do you have? Or can you tell us a little bit about the clients that you have day to day? Maybe you can, maybe you can. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm global luxury account manager. So I work within LCS. So LCS is an organization within Google um, Large Customer Sales, it stands for. So... It means it covers any clients that are like of a certain size and certain spend in terms of what they're actually investing in, in digital media. So I only work with those clients and then I'm just like specialized on luxury. So I have like very big luxury brands that I work with, which is really exciting because like I love that intersection between technology and the luxury industry, whether it's fashion or beauty. So I have within my portfolio, I have fashion brands, I have beauty brands, I have luxury retailers, I also have wines and spirits brands and watches and jewelry. Okay. So it's quite diverse, which makes it really, really interesting. Yeah. And then do you help those clients, I suppose, promote themselves online or is it that you're, um, you're, is, is that the main, the main focus is you want to get them as much exposure as possible? Yeah. So it's kind of like a, it's a full funnel approach. So those clients they'll probably use google products across like all their different divisions so maybe they're leveraging google cloud for one type of their business but then they're also going to be leveraging search so every time you search for their brand what's happening when you search for them so we would help them to make sure they have a really strong search approach then we would also help them in terms of their media so youtube is owned by google so we would help them with their youtube strategy even down to advising on the creatives like how to create the best most captivating most impactful content content for youtube so not just using content you would have created for your tv commercials but maybe having a digital first approach or helping them to recut that content to make it into the different uh, types of formats you'd expect online so whether you're creating like bumpers so that would be six seconds or you're creating like shorter snippets 20 seconds or a full few minutes um also at the moment, because of the current context, no fashion shows, no big events, we're looking a lot at live formats, so YouTube live. So having like basically your, your fashion show only for online uh, audiences, which I think is super, super cool. We also work with products like YouTube Lens. So that one allows you to try on products through YouTube. So it could be trying on like an outfit or it could be trying on like a lipstick shade. So basically, we kind of do a little bit of everything. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I explained that very well, but we have like lots of different ways we work them. And then there's also like the measurement side, so the back end stuff as well, how to leverage Google Ads, how to leverage Google Analytics, how to bring it all together. Attribution is a big focus at the moment. So just like finding out where across your marketing, you're actually getting value. So where are your conversions coming from, whether they're online conversions or in-store, uh, we also are able to work on AI projects local campaigns would be the, the digital project we used for that one. So it would help optimize your digital campaigns to actually bring, bring people in store. So that's one that's really interesting also for, for like even restaurants or within uh, service and hospitality. Okay. 
And um, with the clients that you have, do they have similar requests? Do they have similar needs or is everybody just totally different? Like, it, could you just, <laughs> what, kind of, uh, what kind of exposure or experience do they want to, I suppose, um, display to their current clientele or their potential clients? Yeah. So I guess a lot of it comes down to like, what is the client's objective? So you could have like a beauty brand where they might not really sell direct to consumer. Like they might have their own website, but it's not the objective for them to be really like selling massively through that for them. Their biggest revenue driver might actually be with a retail partner like Sephora, for example. So the online content that they're doing, maybe they want to build like brand awareness and increase purchase intent but the idea is to still bring people in store to have that offline experience with the product. And then you have other brands that are really digital first, really digital forward. And they're like, no, we're direct to consumer brand only. We only do online. And in that case, their strategy is completely different. And then we have brands who, for example, will be launching kind of new or reviving an older brand and they'll want to rebrand themselves. So we can help them do that as well. So, Sometimes we have synergies, certainly within like division. So within perfumes and cosmetics, just because of the lay of the land and the distribution process for that, that division, it will be similar. But then with, with fashion and leather goods, it's going to be quite different. So that's why we kind of stay on our, on our feet because it is still quite diverse. Okay. And have, uh, have you guys seen like a disruption of your clients, I suppose, complained or have they seen a disruption in supply chains and stuff at the moment or? So I think what's been really interesting is since the very beginning with COVID, especially within beauty, companies were really pivoting, but to help, to help people within the medical profession is something that we noticed a lot. So large groups like L'Oreal Group, LVMH Group, very quickly turned their production sites into spaces that were able to create hand sanitizer, for example, that they weren't actually selling, but they, they were giving to medical professionals, giving to hospitals. So that was a huge pivot. And of course that would disrupt, disrupt their supply chain because now they're, they've changed their production to actually help society as a whole, which was like, I, I couldn't believe it. Like the solidarity within the industry was really fantastic. And then in terms of actual disruption along, you know, the, the supply chain to bring your product to the end user, there's definitely been disruption because stores have been closed, but that's where technology became really important. And those direct consumer websites or your retail partners' websites became at the forefront because all of a sudden, you know, let's say 50% of your sales used to happen in store. Stores are closed. Are you going to be down 50% in your sales? Or are you going to say, right, let's make that happen online instead? So for, for most brands, if they're able to pivot in that way, online has been their, their approach to saving that. And we've seen like many companies across many different industries, they're seeing exponential growth at the moment because everyone wants their product all of a sudden, they can only get it online. They can't even meet demand. So yeah. I guess it's different across industries, across markets. It's fluctuating as well as, as times change. It's uh, very interesting about the uh, pivoting and the, uh, you know, the companies making the hand sanitizer and stuff. I, I don't know how true this is, but people say that all the world-class geologists in the world go into mining and all the world-class scientists go into beauty you know so obviously it's the it's where the, it's where the the money is but yeah the uh i thought that was very interesting that they're actually stepping up to the plate and yeah helping the world in a, in a better place that's uh that's fantastic so Absolutely. question that i um ask everybody if you were to advise somebody who was just getting started at the moment in a career um forget about everything that's going on right now i suppose in the world somebody who you know maybe was where you were eight years ago what advice would you give them i i tell everybody this like don't give up on your dream anybody you can make anything happen like if it's something you really want to do if you invest yourself in that completely i think you know this yourself as well you can you can achieve whatever it is that you want whether it's learning a language or moving country or the dream of working in a specific industry it's not you're never going to get there straight away. So invest in the little steps and just say, okay, I'm in this for the long run, but you'll make it happen. So that's why I really encourage the most, like don't give up. And I remember when I was in secondary school, I actually was meant to go to fashion college. I got into the National College of Art and Design and everyone was like, don't go there. You, will, you won't have any friends. There are so few people in that school. And that was like a big fear for me. It's like, what, I won't have any friends. Um, or you will, you'll never get a job, etc. And I shouldn't have given up so easily on that dream. In the end, I managed to get into the industry anyways. But 
through probably like a very roundabout way. So I would say don't give up, you know, on whatever your dream is, you can make it happen. Lois, thanks so much for coming on. Great to see you. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. I hope it's not another eight years until I get to say hello to you again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might see you in, uh, in Crowell at Christmas time or something. Exactly, if we're allowed to fly <laughs> or drive across the country. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Thanks again.